Good evening. FRC Media is pleased to sponsor tonight's forum featuring the candidates for Fall River School Committee. My name is Keith Tebow, Director of FRC Media, and I'll be serving as the moderator for tonight's event. I want to thank the staff of the Cultural Center on South Main Street for being such gracious hosts for our event tonight. All candidates were invited to participate in tonight's forum. Tonight's candidates are, in alphabetical order, Kevin Aguiar, Bobby Bailey, Charles J. Chase Jr., Melissa Costa Doyle, Colin Dias, Paul Hart, Michelle Mimi Larravee, Shelley Pereira, and Sarah Rodericks. Also joining us tonight is a panel of journalists who will be asking the questions to the candidates this evening. They are Michael Sylvia from Fall River Reporter, Pamela Martin from Fall River Government Television, and Alan Zarek of WSAR. Thank you for joining us tonight. The format of tonight's forum is as follows. Our forum will last 90 minutes. There will be no opening statements, but each candidate will be allowed a 90 second closing statement. Each candidate will answer every question posed by our panelists and will have 90 seconds to do so. There will be no rebuttals. Prior to each question, we'll be drawing a name to see which candidate will answer a question first. If there are any names left in our uh, bucket here at the end, we'll draw a name and that candidate will be the first to recite his or her closing statement. All right, we will get right to our first question. Our first question will be offered by Michael Sylvia from the Forward Reporter and it will be answered by, first, Bobby Bailey. Mike? So I want to get what your number one priority would be, but I want to do a little bit more specific than that. So let's just say you were given a task by the school committee to get a million dollar check that you could do it on any project you wanted to for the Fall River Public Schools. What would you spend that money on? First off, um, if we did have a million dollar check, I think the first thing would be identifying what the issues are within the school. Um, so that would consist of, you know, listening to professionals in the field, figuring out what the issues are identifying those, um, devise a plan uh, to get things together. Um, so per se, let's say, you know, we're looking at teacher retention rate. If we're looking at something like teacher retention rate, how are we retaining our good staff to make sure that we can keep them around? Uh, one of the biggest things for me is making sure, A, that we have the people in place that can take care um, the, of our kids and, and make sure that we're actually doing the jobs, so. Thank you. Mr. Chase. If we had that, I would hire a lawyer to go against the rules and regulations uh, uh, governing uh, information going out to the parents uh, regarding what the children are learning in school and how they are learning it in school. On the survey that I just did, uh, that was the number two item that the parents were so left out of everything connected with the school, the ordinary parent is really frustrated. And so I would use that for getting a lawyer who is a good constitutional lawyer to get back, get uh, the teaching back to Fall River that we decide here, the teachers decide what is done, not the state board or uh, with their curriculum or with the school uh, curriculum. That's where I would uh, spend it. Thank you. Ms. Costa Doyle. Um, definitely in increasing after school activities and programs that the kids can be a part of. Um, expanding on what already exists for sports. They've been calling for this. Um, there was a very eloquent student just a couple of months ago that did citizen's input um, regarding this issue. Um, and there are a lot of things that they want to pursue. And one, they shouldn't have to wait till high school to be able to do that. Because once you get into high school, you're already thinking about what you may pursue for a career path and within a year or two you've got to start taking courses that are aimed towards that um, so i think we need to definitely increase that at the elementary and middle school levels and that will set the groundwork for them to then be very involved students once they get to high school and also when kids get to high school a lot of them have to get jobs to help support their family at home um, i would increase i mean i wouldn't want it to be something that we couldn't carry out long term so if if it was a one time and then it was going to go away set us up for several years with stipend 
depends on possibly our increases in pay if it was something that we could carry through in future bu budgets for substitutes. I mean, for well, one of the things is substitutes. Um, a lot of times our schools are short staffed. And in other districts, a lot of times after you've worked 100 days, you go up five or $10 per day, or you earn a couple of sick days. Um, we're not attracting them, and that means we have less bodies in the classroom when people are absent, and that's detrimental to our students. And I'd love to offer English classes for our students that really don't speak our language at all to thank, help thank them you. catch you. up to their peers. Thank you. Mr. Dias. Thank you. First, I just want to thank my grandmother. Happy 70, 73rd birthday. <laughs> And to um, um, Ms. Costa and Mr. Bailey are right when it comes to our teacher retention rates, Mike. We pay our teachers and our paraprofessionals poorly in this district. On a full-time equivalent scale, our teachers and our paraprofessionals aren't only paid below the, the Massachusetts state average, but they're paid below any state average in the country, and that's unacceptable. We need to focus less on these administrator positions there are too many administrative positions in this school district. We need to work on diverting the funding back to the teacher, the paraprofessional, maintenance worker, food staff, and the everyday worker in this great school district. What the million dollar check shouldn't be going for is Superintendent Malone's legal fees, contract buyouts, because trust me, we're going to need a lot more than a million dollar check to cover that mess, which this committee of four did to this city. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to thank FRC Media, Keith, um, and the Cultural Center here tonight. Also, the representatives asking the, at the panel asking the questions from WSAR, Fall River Reporter, and FRG TV. Thank you. Um, I've got a lot of uh, things I could do with a million dollars, uh, but the first one for me is universal pre-K. I think uh, we have to really look into uh, universal pre-K throughout the city for every uh, pre-K child in the city of Fall River. It's a fact that when you get a person into the schools early, early for pre-K, they do much better in first grade, uh, kindergarten in first grade, second grade and beyond. So I think that's something that we've got to really look at. We did look at it um, uh, with the SOA money uh, two years ago. However, the pandemic uh, pretty much put a halt to that. Uh, another key thing and key ingredient, obviously with the pre-K, is the, the space. So we got to find the space for the pre-K uh, children and, and, and um, increasing the pre-K for, uh, uh, for our children. Um, but also too, the th very things are, that are uh, important to me uh, with the million dollars is chronic absenteeism. We have a very high chronic absenteeism in the city of Fall River for our students. We need to get them into the classroom and learn. That's where they're gonna learn. So um, there's more things that I'd like to talk about, but uh, I think I'm running out of time, so thank you. Thank you. Um, candidate John Koleski has, has joined us. Thank you for joining us. Michael, can, Michael Sylvie from Forward Report. Can you re repeat the question for him, please? If I have a million dollars to spend, maybe I push towards better education program. The reason why I would take special education program is that money is actually reimbursable through the, uh, the Medicaid SBMP program. We could also attach on top of that a processing fee. So we would get that money back and still provide services for the people of Fall River. Uh, I think that's how we need to look at every dollar we spend. We need to get something in return that's tangible. And if we can use money and still have it next year to spend, that's a win-win and that's a no-brainer. And I don't think I need the rest of the time to answer that one. <laughs> thank you. Ms. Larravee. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you, panelists. And uh, thank you to the Cultural Club. Um, this is a no-brainer for me. Uh, social emotional learning. I think uh, post COVID concerns with our youth right now uh, is serious. Uh, they've been in isolation for about a year and a half. Uh, their socialization uh, has gone down. Uh, we need more staff to be working with these kids. We need adjustment counselors, we need teachers, we need paras. We need structures in place, programs in place to address the needs of our students. Um, we have an assistant superintendent who was hired to put structures in place to focus on social emotional concerns. If we start addressing these concerns, our teachers won't be as overwhelmed as they are. 
we won't reach the teacher burnout in November and December. We need to get more support staff for our kids, and in return, we'll turn into support staff for our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pereira. Thank you, Mike, for the question. A million dollars, I probably have a million places that I would like to spend that. But I think the best bang for our buck is what a uh, school committee member Hart said, which is universal pre-K. Every study imaginable shows us that it increases performance in our children. It helps with social emotional needs, and it also begins the process where we begin to establish relationships with parents. And as you know, parents being involved in education just allows their children um, to prosper so much. I read something, a study recently, that a fourth grade teacher could pick, eight out of 10 times, could pick the fourth grade students that had received pre-K. So this is not simply just for young kids, this is information and experience that's gonna follow, through, follow them through our school system. Um, as well as helping our parents. We live in a community where, I mean, I know when I'm a single mom and pre-K was expensive for my kids. So not only are we helping parents navigate that, but we're also allowing them to get involved in their children's education right from the get-go. So I think that's the best bang for our buck. Thank you. Ms. Rodericks. So if you gave me a million dollars to spend on our school district, I think I would have a three-pronged plan. So initially, I would want to invest in universal pre-K, right? So as a mom of three kids, my kids all went to preschool. One of them was only able to go to a half day preschool program. And that full day inclusive pre-K really does set the stage for our kids to be ready to learn. It sets the stage for our parents to become engaged in schools. And it sets the stage for those relationship building pieces that are incredibly important. The other piece to that is I would focus on building an inclusive preschool culture. So that way, from the preschool level, our kids are learning about social emotional skills. Our kids are learning about differences um, amongst one another. They're learning that it's completely okay for people from, for kids from different backgrounds to be in the same classroom with them. So it doesn't come as a surprise and we don't look at it as inclusion as a place. Inclusion becomes the culture of what we do. So I would focus on those pieces, and then I would also focus on a piece of family engagement, because if we can get them early, then we're gonna be able to keep them. So million dollars, three different places, that's absolutely where I would stay. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. Yes. Yeah, so uh, universal pre-K is something that is long overdue in, in Fall River. Uh, <clears throat> we have not only a million dollars, we have $20 million to spend. So if you look at this question, for anybody that's been on the committee before, you have to look back to what have we actually done with the millions of dollars that we've received. So for the last four years, let's say, the state has given the school department on average $6 million in increased money every year. What are we actually getting for that money in academic achievement, in overall achievement? So we have to look back to what we've spent money on. I think we've spent money on things that are needed. Additional counselors, uh, additional, uh, supports in the classroom for special ed students. We've put the money into resources that are actually working in our schools. Now we have to see the results. So it's one thing to say we have money. It's another thing to say we use that money and now we're going to show you what the results are. To get back to the universal pre-K, we have been saying this, I know I've been saying it, my colleagues have been saying this for, for a long time. We need to have increased spots for pre-K. We have subcommittee meetings where we get told, oh, we're going to increase 10 seats, 20 seats. We need to, in this district, do something bold. We need to actually spend the money to buy a place, have a universal pre-K across this entire district that's gonna make the difference for this community for years and years and years to come. Thank you. Pamela Martin from FRG TV and Fred TV will be giving our next question and it will be answered first by Shelly Pereira. Okay, thanks Keith. In 1975, just 1% of the schools in the United States had police on duty. Now, 72% of the high schools in the United States have full-time school resource officers, including, of course, our school and high school. In 
in Fall River. Is this appropriate to have full-time school resource officers? Is it necessary? I do think it's necessary. Thank you for the question, Pamela. I do think it's necessary, and I'll tell you why. Obviously, our schools need to be safe for our children, and if we're putting children first, we need to make sure that when they enter those doors, they feel secure and they feel like they're getting taken care of. And the last thing we want, tragedy can happen, unfortunately, everywhere. And our students have witnessed tragedy across the country by way of the media and the news. Um, it's much different for adults to comprehend that. So I think it is absolutely necessary. I think the changes that have been made um, in the public schools, if you, going back a few years now, you know, I think we need locked doors. I think we need cameras at the entrances of doors. I think we need to make sure that our offices are right where people enter so we don't have parents or guardians perusing through the school to try to, you know, get to a child or get to, you know, get to a teacher. I think all those things are necessary. And I think seeing um, police officers in school in that setting also really elevates the profession, I think, and, and provides students with safety and security and not fear. Thank you. Ms. Rogers. Yes. So, Pam, what I'm hearing from that question is really a question of safety, right? So when we're looking at school safety, we're talking about whether we're, we're addressing external safety, right? So keeping the people that we don't want in the building out of the building and also maintaining the safety and culture within the building, right? So we're talking about those two things. I think if we're talking about having school resources, resource officers in the building, then we really have to look at continuing that practice, but with a piece of relationship building. So they need to really be integrated into the everyday culture of the school, as opposed to this is the person we call if there's a problem. So our resource officers do a really good job of trying to get to know our kids, but we have a lot of kids. So if we have more of those supports and we can really have them engaged in their everyday, um, their day-to-day -day, functioning in the building, then we're going to get more out of that practice. Our kids are going to feel safer, our staff are going to feel safer, and then again, those relationship pieces are going to be there. So it becomes one more trusted adult that our kids can seek out. So I think we've got to look at those two pieces of the external safety and the internal safety. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. Yes, yeah, so school resource officers are important when you look at the safety in a building. What we have to do, though, is take a real hard look at what are the laws related to what they can do and what they can't do. We have, uh, we've debated this in subcommittee as well as at the full committee. We're spending over $650,000 a year on eight SROs. Is that money that we could be spending on other things, such as 18 or 20 counselors, uh, other folks that could come in, uh, security guards? There's, there's different things. So we, when you look at SRO, we, we're going to be feeling safe, but are we ultimately safer? We gotta have an actual debate about that. But people are very hesitant to even have that discussion because they feel like uh, if we don't have an SRO in a building, somebody could come in and shoot the building up. We have increased the infrastructure. No one can no longer, in the old days, you walk in a building. Can't do that now. You have to get stopped, you have to get buzzed in, so there's safety things that are in place. But we also have to just look at the laws as well as the MOUs that we have. The MOUs, for instance, two years ago we were told uh, we can't have the school resource officer help the administration maintain order in a building. I've never heard something so crazy. That we have a, a sworn police officer in uniform and they can't help us to maintain order. We change that so they can at least help. But the laws are going along, no penalties, no, none of that. So we have to just be honest and have a tough discussion about whether we need three, eight, or ten. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Um, <clears throat> I agree with Sarah um, when it comes to relationship building. Um, I think that's a key component uh, when we're talking, uh, you know, about the relationship amongst the, the SACs in the building, whether it's the administration in the building, the teachers in the building. Um, you know, I think that's exactly where it starts. Um, you know, obviously school safety is, is a big issue and it's increased, um, but I think we have to also look at a ton of factors. How do we get to this point? Um, what's the student population size? Um, you know, and, and draw back and really take a step back and, and, and see where we're going with things. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the biggest things, you know, for me going around and talking to some of these students, uh, you know, we just have to make sure they also feel supported. 
Um, a lot of our kids, um, you know, that we do work with also need places to go to. They need outlets. Um, you know, so whether we're talking about, you know, school adjustment counselors or, or things of that nature and people to talk to, um, I think that's, that's a major factor um, to what goes on. Thank you. Mr. Chase. I feel we need more counselors, especially with this COVID problem that has caused so many, you know, frustrations amongst the uh, students, the ability to, uh, to learn, et cetera. For that reason, we need more counselors that are well qualified uh, to assist these students to get over their fears, their possible suicides, things such as this. As far as the offices go, my experience up the industrial park was that the officers coming, they do a great job, but the, them coming to the site of some problem always took, uh, well, more than the fire department, took more time. Uh, if we have officers right there, I feel that will be the safest thing, especially in this atmosphere where violence is promoted. You see some of the cities like Portland or uh, Seattle, um, we just have to have more protection in the schools, but protection for this and protection for the body itself. Thank you. Ms. Costa Doyle. Um, there are definite pros and cons for me. Um, I think on the pro side, we've all lived through decades now of images across the news of mass school shootings, um, which are horrific and obviously um, you know, if we had people right on site, you hope that maybe we would have been able to intervene more in some of those um, situations, you know, before the injuries and, and worse were are allowed to um, grow during the time of waiting for response. Um, you also have, especially in a large district, 10,000 kids in urban environment, you sometimes have family dynamics. Um, that are really, the teachers are so swamped as it is. Sometimes you have parents showing up who don't have, you know, aren't supposed to have access to that child, or there are custody issues, court issues. Um, so sometimes in that sense, we could use the extra security. And I also, when I worked in the middle school and high school levels, um, I've definitely seen, you know, a lot of fights. I've seen violence. I've seen teachers assaulted. Um, my mom, own mom, was, she's, a, she's a retired para, was assaulted several years ago by a nine-year-old. Um, not that I want to see a nine-year-old arrested by any means. But I mean, it does happen. Um, on the flip side, though, a lot of the acting out and aggression is sometimes part of a child's men mental um, you know, illnesses or special needs. And as long as the officers are on board with knowing the kids in the building every single year and who has those challenges, we can prevent Thank them you. from being over-policed and you. harmed. Thank you. Mr. Dias. Thank you for the question, Pamela. Um, I think Ms. Um, Rodericks and Ms. Pereira hit the nail on the head. It's a safety issue. We need to protect our students. We need to protect our kids. And I agree with a lot of what my colleagues said on the stage here. So I'm just gonna go a little step further. I would like to see the parochial schools and the charter schools also have an SRO. We, they, we have kids in the city. We need to make sure they're all protected, maintained. We don't need to have a tragic accident happen. And I would like to work with the city council to see maybe an ordinance passed to see these parochial schools, the charter schools have on, on place at least one SRO so we can make <coughs> sure we feel that the parents make sure we feel safe, the children can feel safe, and there's nothing wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But um, yes, we didn't make sure we, we make sure our children are safe. I think that's the most important thing we need to do. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, uh, Keith. Yeah, no, I think there's, um, there's a very uh, strong partnership with the SROs uh, and our schools in our neighborhood, in neighborhood schools throughout the city. Um, I think we obviously, uh, the, I think between that partnership, they definitely provide a very safe environment in our schools. Um, but I also want to, you know, I take it a step further. Um, I think a, an important piece of the SROs is that they pretty much provide almost a community policing aspect uh, when they're at the schools and they're in the neighborhood. Um, and also, too, their, their job doesn't stop there. They actually will go to all neighborhood meetings throughout the city and attend those, uh, those uh, meetings at the school, whether it's a, a city issue to be dealt with or a school issue to be dealt with. 
So I'm a big fan of the SROs within our schools, and it's not going to take me 90 seconds to answer that one, but, but I'm all in favor of that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Koleski. Anytime you can put an adult um, mentor, somebody for the kids to look up to, respect, learn a little bit about life that they're not going to find out in the classroom, I'm always going to be in favor of that. Um, I would actually like to see that position be elevated within the police force so that way having that credentialing or having that service under your belt actually makes you look more favorable for promotion. Uh, I did time as an Army recruiter back in the day and the RSOs that they had on the campuses there, that was pretty much a dead end job for them. And that's very sad because the individuals they're interacting with are going to be the individuals in five or six years that may be getting pulled over on the side of the road and there's nobody to say anything nice about you in that room. And that's something very scary. I remember growing up, we had the, the neighborhood police officer was Officer Donovan. If there was a problem, that's who you went to. I don't know what happened, but it, we just no longer have that police officer that's in that area and that's their area of responsibility and everybody knows him. And putting him in the school alleviates a lot of that. Thank you. Ms. Larrabee. Thank you. Um, I do think it's necessary, especially in the times that we live in now. Uh, it's vastly different from the 1970s. Um, I totally agree uh, with some of these people up here about the mentoring aspect and building relationships between these SROs. Years back, we used to, we used to see the SROs in the community all the time. They used to go to the basketball games. They used to, uh, you know, check out what was going on at the parks. Um, but I think we really need to get back to them just not be, being, uh, having that stigma of showing up to the fight that's happening in the cafeteria. We need them as mentors. We need them for that caring adult in the schools. Um, he just said, spot on, the more caring adults we have in our building, the better. And uh, Mr. Hart also mentioned that we have a great relationship with the police department right now. And I, I just think it's going to get better. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Zarek will ask our next question. And it will be answered first by Paul Hart. Are you in favor of offering the current interim superintendent a new contract and removing the interim label? Or should a search committee be appointed with an eye toward perhaps selecting someone who reflects the growing diversity of this district? Um, I'm glad that, uh, that we did um, vote for uh, uh, Maria Ponce as the interim superintendent um, because I think it was sorely needed and I think the uh, school committee eventually did the right thing. Um, I do think that Maria Ponce has done a very admirable job uh, thus far. Uh, I have a very good communication, communication with her, and I know that she does uh, have that same communication with the other school committee members. And I think she is, brings a, a little bit of a different uh, aspect to the superintendent's position that we've had in the past maybe two or three. The fact that she grew up in Fall River, she was educated in Fall River, she worked uh, as a, a teacher, she worked her way up to uh, the principal, assistant principal, and now she's our interim superintendent. And I think that's something that what this city should look at um, when we're hiring a superintendent. Now, again, when, um, when, when it comes up, when it becomes available that we're gonna decide on, a, on a, a superintendent, I think that we probably should look at some others as well. But right now, I think Maria Ponce is, uh, is the person to lead our district. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Koleski. Um. There's only three people at this table that have been in the room with her and actually had an open and honest conversation, so I don't have any judgment. Uh, I could probably say something in her favor and something against her. Um, I just haven't had any questions with her or any contact with her to make a, the best decision possible, and that's what we're there to do. And So I'll pass that one down to somebody who has been in the room with her. Thank you. Ms. Larrabee. Thank you. Um, Maria Ponce is um, born, raised in Fall River, Massachusetts, and she bleeds Charisse. So she, um, she is a very, very intelligent, 
uh, she person, she leads by example, all the reasons uh, Paul mentioned. She's been a teacher, she's been an administrator, she's been a principal, she's, she's done it all. And for that reason, I think her faculty, her staff, uh, respects her immensely. Um, can I sit here right now and say that, oh yes, I think uh, Ms. Ponch should be the superintendent. I think she would do an amazing job just like she's doing an amazing job right now. Um, but I think uh, her name should be thrown in, in the ring just like everybody else and, and we have a search and we find what's best for our district and our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pereira. Thank you, Alan, for the question. Um, I think Maria is kind, caring, and inclusive. I think she brings people together and she boosts morale amongst our educators. Um, and as others have said, this is somebody who was born and raised in the city, has experience in the classroom as well as running a school, as well as assistant superintendent. I mean, her resume is pretty good. I think that, um, you know, I have a hard time sometimes with, we like to encourage people right from Fall River. Get, it, get educated. If you got to leave to go to college, that's great, but we want you to come back to make a change. But then we tend to hire superintendents from, you know, an hour away. Not to say they wouldn't do the job, but why don't we for once just give it to the person who was born and raised in Fall River because when you're born and raised here, you have a love for this community that no one else an hour away has. And I think if we want to talk about teacher retention, we need to talk about increasing morale. And I think Maria could be our ticket to that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rogers. So I've had the, the privilege of working with Maria in collaboration on some projects um, in the past. And I think just given the fact that she has worked her way up in this district and we do need the stability of somebody who understands our kids, who understands our families, and who understands what our staff are going through, I think it would make sense to open that to Mrs. Ponce. I think you could look at that as a temporary basis. So it doesn't mean that you offer a five-year contract. It means that we extend it beyond the first few months that we've had because we've only had her in place since July 1st. And I don't think it's really fair to say you've been great enough to lead our district in this time of, of chaos, but now we're going to pull that back and we're going to look for someone else. So I do think we should extend the time that she's been here, but also consider what other factors do we need in a superintendent. Um, in addition to that, we have to have that conversation with her. So we can all speculate, but nobody knows what she wants. So I think before anything, that's a conversation that has to be had. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. Nailed it. So uh, where we currently stand with her, uh, with Mrs. Ponce, is that she's the interim superintendent until the spring, and then we w we're going to determine, as a committee at that time, we'd, obviously it will be a new committee, we'll determine at that time if there's mutual interest, if there's interest on her behalf, as well as the school department's behalf. I think that she's been a breath of fresh air from what we've dealt with over the last several years. She respects people. She's not looking to spin the issues. When I ask her a question, I don't have to try to figure out the riddles of whether she's telling me the truth or not. She's up front. She's hardworking. Like I said, she doesn't have the smoke and mirrors tactics that Dr. Malone had for years. So we ask her a question, we get an answer. We ask her to do something, she does it and gets back to us. The, the very basic pieces of the job. So, so far, it's going really well. We need to have achievement here. We need to have academic achievement. We need to be looking at the issues when we go into the spring, whether we're making adequate progress, all the systems in place and the like. I do like Mrs. Ponce, and I also believe, and I've done this in the past when I've been on this committee, if you're in the district and you're qualified to do the job, the key is qualified to do the job. If you're qualified to do the job, it's insulting to go out for a search. So if she's doing a good job and we think she's the right person, let's not have a, a dog and pony show search because we're going to hire the person internal. If we believe in her, put our name behind her, and let's move forward together. But we don't need a dog and pony so show search, which a lot of people might want. Th thank you. Mr. Bailey. Um, 
I'm a firm believer of investing in people from the area. Um, if, I mean, like, you know, they were saying earlier, I love this city. Um, and, you know, when it comes to hiring people within the city, I, I think Fall River is a very unique place and you have to be from here to understand it. Um, so, you know, I've had nothing but great interactions with Ms. Ponce. Um, you know, so just like Mr. Aguiar was saying, I think, you know, we have to take a look at things and see how things progress over, over the year. Um, you know, and if she's the best candidate for the job, then she's the best candidate for the job. Um, you know, as, as far as hiring a search committee, I, I think you have to let someone, it's, it's such a short amount of time, um, you know, to really make that judgment. Um, but if she's doing great at what she, what she does in the spring when the time comes, then I think that's the candidate you go with. Thank you. Mr. Chase. It seems from what I've uh, been hearing that she is a fabulous uh, candidate. I myself also um, lean towards someone coming from this community because they understand the people, they've lived here, um, they know what the needs are, uh, they uh, understand how the children have grown here. So I would tend to say that if she has those qualifications, then there is no need to go for a, a search. I, when I was with the factory, why personnel we would work that way. Uh, we tried to get people that were close by here and we felt we could trust. My only concern would be, like I said, uh, the first round is, is there going to be that openness with the parents and with the children between the school and the home so that the parents are upbringing the children, not the school upbringing the children as some school districts are trying. Thank you. Ms. Costa Doyle. Yeah, so um, I worked for five years, um, a little bit with the ELT periods, which are periods that happened during the day that were part of the extended learning days um, that we had until very recently there. So I provided some enrichment and it was the rest of the time was after school. She was one of four principals that we had in five years, which makes maintaining and sustaining anything that is successful difficult because you have different theories coming in and out of the door every year. Um, that program was a 15 year program um, that was credit, it was highlighted in the New York Times before I even got there as one of the programs that had really lifted that school from a level four status. Um, it dealt with literacy. It was very closely tied to the ELA classes. It was a phenomenal pro program and we were still getting 60 kids coming out to audition for every show that I did. Um, it was a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of the support. Um, and I would hear from the kids a lot that certain other kids and other pursuits were much more highlighted um, within the school than they were. However, it's the totality of Maria's career and not just me and the one program I worked in. And for that, I think we need to consider that she has been throughout the district um, for I, most of her career, I believe, and knows the history of certain situations, knows the history of um, our kids and how programs have evolved and disappeared, which is of huge, val huge value. But I would like to also just Thank hear you. other candidates because you, you always find out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dias. Thank you for, qu Thank you for the question, Alan. Um, I just want to say Maria Ponce is a very nice lady, and she always answers any question I have and I'm not even a member of the school committee yet. Um, I'm inclined to, as like Mr. Aguiar said, um, I'm inclined to keep her if she wants to stay in the district. If she doesn't want to stay in the district, I think we should open up the search committee and we should hire the most qualified person for the job. I think um, doing research, these search committees in the past for Superintendent Malone have been not very transparent and I'm a candidate who will bring transparency to the table. And as another candidate said, we should be, I would really like to hire, keep a superintendent that's in Fall River and not an hour away. And we talk about an hour away, the former superintendent would use the Fall River Twitter page to promote businesses from an hour away. His favorite hot dog place in Dorchester. We should be promoting Sam's Meat Pies. Our favorite hot dog place for me would be Nick's Hot Dogs. But again, we need to hire the most qualified person for the position if Maria Ponce doesn't want to stay. Thank you. We will uh, go back now to Michael Silvia from Fall River Reporter for our next question. 
And that question will be answered by Mimi Laravi. So I'd like to throw a current event issue that happened today. We put out an article. Um, a Massachusetts school teacher out of Hanover was recently fired for posting a TikTok video while she was running for school committee. She stated that she was running so students wouldn't be able to choose their gender or be taught critical race theory. She claims her freedom of speech was violated when she was fired. As a school committee member, would you have called for her resignation or would you have supported her freedom of speech? I, I'm really not sure what she was trying to get through. I couldn't really hear you that well. She, she was saying that if she was elected, she wouldn't allow students to pick their gender in the classroom or um, no, I didn't hear it. allow critical race theory to be taught in schools. That was her campaign promise on a 30 second TikTok and she was fired right. for that. Okay. Uh, so with that, I have a better understanding. Um, first of all, uh, we'd have to look at policy. Okay. We would have to look at what is in our policy, our social media policy, and address anything that has to do with one of our teachers putting it out there. Um, would I have a, a, a agreed to fire her or or discipline her? I can't answer that right now with having all the without having all the facts in front of me. Um, but where do I draw the line? Uh, freedom of speech. Uh, freedom of speech is obviously very very important. Uh, but again, we have to follow policy. If they break policy in our school district, it has to be addressed. Freedom of speech, absolutely 100%. I mean, we, all, we, we have this problem going on now, everywhere in America. It's, it, some of it's not true. A lot of it's false. Uh, you believe what you want to believe, but the amendment is in place for a reason. But I can't answer, I can't make a decision on whether or not I would fire someone or discipline somebody without having all the facts and going by our policy. Thank, thank you. Ms. Pereira. Thank you, Mike, for the question. The first thing that raised a flag to me, you said she was a school teacher running for school committee. Oh, okay, because that right away, I was like, ethic, violation, conflict of interest. But okay, now I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Um, so I would say, to, not to mimic what Mimi said, but first thing you have to do is look at policy. It's when you're employed, you sign that handbook, you agree to follow the rules of your employment. If you choose to be a social worker, a teacher, a police officer, even a firefighter, you are, because the community is looking up to you, you are held to a different standard and you have to follow the policy. So if the policy stated you cannot talk about your opinions on gender or race, and she broke, which is kind of, cra but kind of crazy to me, but if that's what the policy dictated and that's what the policy stated, and she went against that policy, then to me there's grounds for, for termination. Um, with that being said, I think freedom of speech is, is crucial and it's important. But as a teacher, you have to understand that when you use terms like that, you're alienating quite a few people in the student body. So I don't know how effective of a teacher you're going to be. Thank you. Ms. Rogers. So when I hear a story like that, I think of a few things. Um, we can talk about freedom of speech all we want. And the reality is, is that we don't have a choice in whether or not we support freedom of speech. Clearly, we do. But it's written into our Constitution. So this is not an option. But I do think that we have to understand what that really means, that freedom of speech does not mean freedom of consequences of what you said. So I would go back again to what is our district policy around social media use. And if we are using social media, if teachers are using social media in, in, in stating their opinions about things that really don't have a place there, then we have to be clear about what their impact is on our students. Does that create an exclusive environment for our kids? So my whole 
platform has been on inclusion. I know what it's like to have a kid who isn't included in anything, and I know what it's like to have kids that are included in everything. I don't ever want another child to feel that way. So we've got to look at what our policies are, we have to look at what the impact is, and we also have to understand that freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequences. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. So as a school committee member, we don't deal with personnel at all. So we would never have to, as a school committee member, actually make that decision whether a person would be terminated or not. With that being said, there's employment law in Massachusetts. There's other things that have to be looked at as to what can a person do and not do. What would the effect of those, their decisions on social media or outside of the workplace, what are the, um, how is that going to affect the school, the children, uh, the classroom, the school, it depends on what the issue is. So in cases like that, we need a superintendent to do an investigation. So I think part of the question was, would you call for an investigation? Of course, because any staff member that is representing the four of the schools, whether it be during school, after school, knows that we expect a certain type of behavior and there's consequences to any behavior that's going to be contrary to or just, to, you know, just being appropriate. So the superintendent, the human resource director, I would definitely ask them to do an investigation. But I just want to be clear that the school committee would never have an opportunity to vote on such a matter. But when you look at the th situations that have happened here, the school committee really only can do anything to the superintendent. So we can only fire the superintendent. We cannot do any discipline to any other person in the school department. Uh, I was very consistent during the superintendent's issues that we needed to do a thorough full investigation up into termination. I didn't win that vote, but that's what we should do when we have it, and I would have hoped that a superintendent would look at the issues as well. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with the rest. Um, you know, I think you would have to look at policy and then also, um, you know, see, see what, is, what freedom of speech consists of, right? Um, you know, we're talking about like social media policy, interaction with kids, and um, so I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, really make that decision unless I knew those things straightforward, so. Thank you. Mr. Chase. Um, I don't agree with any termination without having steps going up to the termination. Uh, what we always did was we would do verbal reprimands if we felt that something was out of place. Now this is not, like they said, not for us to do, but the, the people connected with, the, uh, with this that were investigating or uh, claiming that something was wrong, they should have had verbal um, reprimands to the person and cautioning the person against doing such things unless it is a, an egregious um, action that, sh uh, that that person has done. Second step would be to have written, uh, you know, complaints against what was being done. The final thing being to go to court, and this is a step that the courts will very much agree with, uh, that you've gone through these steps well, okay, well, this uh, person should be terminated. There's no problem. Thank you. Ms. Costa Doyle. Um, I agree with what Sarah said in terms of um, we have a right to freedom of speech, but not necessarily without consequences. However, I fully support doing a thorough invest. I mean, these are people's lives, their careers, um, and they make the choice to talk about one issue or another, and there are people in in society right now that want people fired immediately on both sides um, for opinions and things that they support outside of work. Um, the problem that happened recently in Fall River, um, I think that was a complicated one, but if the teacher, with, in this case in Fall River, is a special ed teacher, sometimes the children can't always communicate at home if the, the political opinions are translating into the classroom. But I've also worked alongside many people who I know and I've seen their posts have very different political beliefs than I have, but I have never seen that affect the job that they do when they're at work. And I do the same. I'm a professional. I go in, I teach my subject area. Um, 
it's not something, it's being very misconstrued in the media as to what is going on in classrooms these days, and I can assure you a lot of it is, is not accurate. So it needs to be fair, um, but we need to be sure it's not something that children are seeing it will harm their mental health um, and feeling about going to school and feeling safe and supported in their own beliefs Thank and you. their own identities. Thank you. Mr. Dias. Thank you, Mike. As um, Mr. Aguiar said, the school committee can't fire staff. They can only fire the superintendent. But I hear all this talk about policy, policy. <clears throat> the committee of four didn't fire the superintendent, and he violated plenty of district policy. And with this particular case, I feel like in the school district, it's something I want to change. If you're not a part of what's called in the city the good old boy network, you get more leeway to violate policy as if you are not. And I think we need to have a bigger conversation, one, about our policies on book. We need to make sure we have a sexual harassment policy and more policies against bullying of staff in our school district. That's one. And the second, we gotta make sure we elect school committee members to have the courage to do the right thing. When you have a superintendent that violated policy, you gotta hold them accountable, not have these executive session meetings, not, you know, just, shove the issue down the road, hopefully the voters forget about it. That's unacceptable, and that's going to change when I'm elected. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for the question. Uh, there's not really much more I can, I, I can add to this. I mean, Kevin pretty much said everything, that we don't have that ability uh, to fire the staff. Uh, we pretty much you know, can obviously, uh, like Kevin and I did uh, previously, uh, voted to terminate the, the uh, superintendent. But other than that, um, you know, it would be up to the superintendent in that scenario and the, and the human resources uh, head that uh, Kevin Aguiar mentioned. Um, so, again, that is not much more I can add. I would obviously encourage the investigation um, and would obviously, we'd, we'd get, uh, you know, uh, keep abreast of what was going on within it. But other than that, I have nothing more to add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Koloski. Again, I need more context in the situation. Um, I've seen teachers suspended for much more um, threatening actions. Uh, so I, I, I'm pretty sure if you, you start dig, digging a hole, you'd find out a little bit more. Uh, on the political side, that's what she believes is the popular opinion for the people she's trying to represent. And if she's right, she may be rewarded. If she's not, she's going to be penalized. Decisions have consequences. Words have meaning. Uh, what I will tell you is in my time in the military, I, went, I, I got to see us go from a peacetime military to a wartime military. I saw the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I saw the tra tra uh, trans service, yes, no, yes, no, back and forth 10, 15 times. Uh, women in, in, in the infantry, I, I saw policy changes that reshaped the organization. And what I told every single one of them soldiers is how I feel about it too. If they, this organization does not represent something that you are willing to give your time to, you need to go find new employment. You shouldn't have to be fired when you're in disagreement with what your employer is pushing out to, the, uh, to society. You should have the moral obligation to leave that employment if you disagree with what they're saying. So, Thank you. Pamela Martin is up next with our next question. And that question will be answered first by Kevin Aguiar. Okay. Children who speak Spanish at home as their primary language comprise 27% of our district. That's just about double from 10 years ago. However, teachers tell me that they have too few classroom language interpreters, and oftentimes it's the students who serve as interpreters for their peers. And so while that may be kind and helpful, should fellow students have that responsibility? But the district is having difficulty attracting and keeping language interpreters. How do we solve this? Well, the, um, obviously the numbers speak for themselves, but I'm not sure whether you're referring to in language interpreters. So in the classroom, we have bilingual teacher assistants, we have bilingual teachers, we have both people that can speak multiple languages. So they're not necessarily uh, called interpreters, but I, you know, at some point I don't believe that students should be obviously translating, that's not appropriate. At the same time, the laws are, uh, are such, too, that the students are going to be learning English. So we're working on a dual language program that they just started. I'm not sure how, I guess it's off the ground. 
where, where they're going to be learning 50 percent of each so they're going to we're going to try in this district to do that across all different schools which is an important piece it costs money obviously but it, I think it's money well spent if it the pro, if the program is run properly and we're getting the students to benefit from it so it's in the first year I do think we have to look at it when you look at the millions of dollars that we've received over the last several years you can specifically see a number probably in the millions of dollars and resources that we have submitted at the, as a school committee to fund bilingual folks that can work with our children in all various um, languages whether it be a, a director a counselor uh, we have bilingual guidance counselors now we have school adjustment counselors so we have increased by tenfold over the last three years the money and the resources based on the numbers that you um, talked about thank you mr. Bailey um, when you look at the city itself I think the uh, Spanish population has grown exponentially um, I think we also need to look at representation um, in the classrooms when it comes to Spanish-speaking teachers and learn to attract them as well. Um, not just TAs, um, you know, learning to attract actually people who look like them and can relate to them and speak their language. Um, I think there's so many layers that go into that. Um, although you have kids that are translating, um, I think those kids should be learning and not teaching in a class because that's they're actually not, no longer students when they do that. Now they're, they are actually the TAs. Um, and we're not putting those kids in the seats to be TAs. We're putting the kids in the seats so they can learn. Um, so I think that's one of the, the biggest things for me. Thank you. Mr. Chase. I'll go back a few years. Uh, the end of World War II. We had a tremendous number of displaced persons coming into the States from Asia, from uh, Europe, etc. These students were not treated the way the tr uh, students are being treated now, getting translators, interpreters. I've done that work myself, so I know how it works. But um, they did not have that back in those days. They came here and they had to learn English quickly, and they did. The kids in school, I had uh, two that uh, were right next to me and they, uh, they went on to have fabulous uh, careers in college, in uh, business, etc. We need to place more emphasis on English as our language here because that's where uh, most of the business is done and that's where they're going to be successful. It's fine to uh, placate them by having that language out there but let, let them have the time that they are forced to learn English. They have to learn English much better. That's where, the, where any money should be spent. Thank you. Ms. Costa Doyle. Um, this is a problem that goes back a long way. I'm 46 and my mom became a para once I started kindergarten. She worked at the old Sylvia and Hartwell, um, Connell, and then she finished her career at Spencer Borden. But my mother actually she never got paid extra for it, but she translates, she's fluent in Portuguese. And all that 40 years ago, she was always called to the office to get on the phone and talk to a parent who didn't speak English. She translated letters that had to go home into fluent Portuguese. Um, so it's a long-standing problem, and it's just evolving in what the language that's needed is now. Um, so it's unfortunate that we haven't really come up with more tools to deal with that. Um, I know that recently, I want to say the funding was through United Interfaith Action, but I'm not positive. They did, um, they provided training, I guess they offered the funding for it, to give our police department um, lessons in conversational Spanish, so to help them when they're out on the streets. So there must be funding out there that's available that could accomplish both. It could help our staff um, get a certain, you know, um, have a little bit pool of language that they can use that's conversational at a minimum, as well as offering extra classes to the students that need to learn the English. So on, on both parts, let's try to get some more training in Spanish for our educators, but let's also work at more English services for our kids because they will need it when they move um, further up and into Thank you. the career fields. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Dias. I think Ms. Costa made some great points, and um, I think we do need to hire more teachers that speak Spanish, Khmer, Portuguese. 
And we're not going to do that if we have these low, I'm going to repeat it, if we have these low teacher retention rates, we need to, again, up their salary. And, and I think, going back to the teacher retention rates, and I think the FREA needs to step up their game a little bit. I think they need to show more help for their fellow educators. I think they need to help with the full-time equivalent salary for educators. And I think uh, maybe a short-term solution for this would be technology. I think we need to look more into what technology can we bring into the district to help with the translation a little bit. I have a translator right on my phone. Like the technology is there for us to help with the translation, but I think the bottom line is we need to hire more teachers that speak other languages, and the way we're gonna do that is fixing the teacher retention rate in the school district. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Keith. No, I, I agree with what, what Colin said and mostly what everybody else has said, be, uh, including uh, Mr. Aguiar. It's, we're in the process of um, potentially hiring more um, uh, teachers with, with Spanish-speaking teachers, but it's been difficult. There's no question about it. Um, and I think there's, there's a good point that Colin makes as far as the, you know, the salary part of it. So I think, you know, I think that what we have to do is we have to make a strong commitment to it. Because like what you said, Pam, 25%, uh, four, five, six years from now, it's gonna be probably 50, 40%. So we've gotta start moving on it. And, and, and I'm not saying that our current administration hasn't tried, they have. <clears throat> but we've gotta just do a better job uh, at, at doing this because it, that's gonna be uh, an issue. And I, I've heard it many times with the students interpreting. That's completely should not be happening. So uh, that, that's all I have to add to that, Keith, thank you. Mr. Koleski. I've actually seen a successful policy enacted out in San Mateo County, California. Um, what they did is they did the, the language portion of the school day with the parent, if they wanted to be present, they're with it, so it was solidified at home. They did not use administrators or faculty from the school. They contracted. The reason why contract works a little bit better in that realm is you actually have to meet benchmarks to continue to get paid. We're still cleaning up after, on Hurricane Katrina, and it's been 17 years. When you put the government in charge of doing something, there's no motivation to get it done. Uh, the other thing that they did was they invite the parent in, they contract out, and they gave a $300 stipend for teachers that had the native's language already. Uh, that takes care of the pay that's a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of the funding, and we get people that won't have to pay pensions for in the future for skills that may not be as necessary as they are right now if we do our job correctly. Thank you. Ms. Larravee. Thank you. Um, we currently have uh, bilingual staff, teachers, paras in place, but I agree we don't have enough. Um, with the Student Opportunity Act and the ESSER three monies coming in, um, hopefully we can step up our game and, and start getting more and more staff in that are bilingual and, and can relate to the kids. Um, one of the best things that was ever presented to me was this DLE program uh, getting off the ground right now, actually. Uh, 46 kindergarten kids uh, started uh, in this dual language education program in our district uh, two weeks ago. They're going to be half and half, half in Spanish, half in English, uh, rotating every day. These kids are going to come out of this program and be completely bilingual by the fifth grade. Next year, we'll be accepting another kindergarten class, one kindergarten class, and these 46 will move on. These are the out-of-the-box ideas we need to sustain uh, what we're doing here in our district. It's important work. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pereira. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for the question. Um, it's obvious that we've moved to a much more diverse community and hence a diverse classroom. Um, to answer the first part of the question, no, I do not think that a student should be tasked with being an educator. I think that translations, um, when we're talking about social interactions with peers, recess, that's fine, that's learning from each other. 
Um, we obviously need more diversity in our school system in general. And then to go on to the second point of how do we recruit that, I could be mistaken. Um, some of the school committee members would probably know, but I believe I was watching a school committee meeting not too long ago, and I think this is a good way to go, where they went out and got college students to come in, whether it was an internship or what have you, and came in to be mentors. Now, keeping in mind, these don't have to be college students who are choosing to study education. They can be college students who are choosing to study sociology. But when they get in that classroom environment and realize the change that they can make, many of them may decide education is for them. So I think that's a good option. Um, and I just want to end by saying that, um, just so the people at home are aware, I'm very aware of the responsibilities of the school committee being policy, uh, curriculum, and budgeting. I didn't take that as the question Mike was asking. I thought he was asking if I agreed that the school department terminate her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rogers. So the short answer to that is no, students should not be responsible for translating for other students. And I think everybody here can agree with that, that that's not the role of a child. Um, the, the other piece to that is how do we recruit more teachers that are bilingual that can reflect the needs of our community? Um, I think we have to make a concerted effort to have multi-language speakers at every level of our school department. So a teacher isn't going to want to come here if their, their language capacity isn't valued, right? So we have to show that at all levels of our school district that we have folks that value this, that this is an important piece for us. You know, to say that we should only have them learn Engl English really concerns me because that's not going to help them compete in a global economy. So if we're setting our kids up for success, knowing that kids learn two languages really does support um, their future success, it's really important. And so why wouldn't we want to set them up from kindergarten? Why wouldn't we want to set them up from early ages? Thank you. Looking at the clock, I wanna to try to get one more question in before closing statements, but we're gonna have each of you answer one minute time frame instead of 90 seconds for this last question. It'll be from Alan Zarek from WSAR and Charles Chase will get the question first. Six of you will be elected of course in November and I'm curious what each of you might do to ensure that the new BMC Durfee building will be cared for in a way that, that's, that its predecessor wasn't. Let's be honest with one another. That building was allowed to die. Now, will this building be looking as good 40 years from now? Will it still be upright? What can you do to ensure that? First of all, I I'm, have always been opposed to the new building. It, it was leaking before people were going in there. Um, I come from a, con a contracting family. The, there were methods that could have been done to save the old building. Um, the new building looks nice, but if you don't take care of the roof, um, I think you're going to have some major problems down the road and not too far off. We have to have an outside, non-connected to any politician here in the city, an outside firm come in, do an evaluation of what should be done to preserve it for the long term. Um, that's my best suggestion. Thank you. Ms. Costa Doyle. Yeah, it might be a good idea to use um, you know, some of the money that we have in relief right now. Um, now would be a good time to do that, to maybe get an independent um, contractor specialist in this area to really let the committee know a solid plan to, that they can then be the stewards of for, for years and years to come to make sure that that does not, that things are not attended to um, in the way that they should be. I know with this building, I've heard, I mean, I've heard rumors and things like that, but there's been a lot of people connected. I believe even Superintendent Malone had a son working or had um, a role in that building. Enough, enough. Like we need just outside professionals tell us what we need to do and let the school committee figure out how we can make that happen. Thank you. Mr. Dias. That's a great question. and. Um, and that's what I've been talking about this entire campaign. Um, so my ads on WSAR, my platform, 
the biggest thing was maintaining schools, and it's a two-fold plan. One, we need to hire an outside construction firm to audit all of our schools and submit a report to the school committee outlining all our structural issues and solutions to them. And secondly, would be to create a maintenance committee with experts in the maintenance field to hold regular and most importantly public meetings to discuss and have solutions to the problem with these schools. You know, we shouldn't have um, therapy building committee meetings which aren't publicized, aren't televised to the public. And then some of these members on the Durfee Bill Committee, you have them, they're also, there's a conflict of interest there because they're also a part of the Durfee, like they're contractors for Durfee. We need to make sure we have outside people who do the right thing every day for this community. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Alan, for the question. But I do believe that um, there needs to be some type of case maintenance uh, program for not just Durfee, but throughout the whole district. I remember being on the uh, city council um, and that was one thing that we uh, made, wanted to make sure that those particular schools that were being built, um, that, that they had that a case maintenance uh, program with them, and I think uh, attached to the school with the budget. And I think that um, they did a pretty good job. Uh, however, I do think that um, in, this, in this case, for you specifically said Alan Durfee, I think it's a wise thing to maybe uh, d uh, start and develop a uh, maintenance committee for that school with professionals. Thank you. Mr. Koleski. One, I'd have to see the contract that was done for the school to see if there's any upkeep added into that. I know when I've done property uh, contracting in before, I definitely had, hey, if this breaks in the next year, you gotta do something about it. Um, I'm not sure it's written in that aspect. Uh, for regular cleanliness and, and, and upkeep, I, I think we can go back to having some, some of the students taking some pride in their environment. Uh, no different for them sweeping up the floors to us going outside, clapping the, uh, the chalk erasers together. Uh, for things that need minor structural repairs, I keep hearing about how good the, uh, the Durfee vocational program is going. <clears throat> Give them a little bit on job training. If it gets troubleshot by the, uh, the instructor and saying, hey, this is something that we can't touch, find the best solution possible. But also look at how long do you think that, computer, that, that building's gonna last, look at the depreciation, set aside. If you use it, great. If, uh, if you use it, sorry. If you don't use it, keep it for the next time around. Thank you. Ms. Larravee. Thank you. Um, I agree. The um, D2, Durfee 2, I guess we've been referring to it as was a disaster. Um, and I don't think they had any planned maintenance uh, involved, but um, as a district, I do believe we need a maintenance plan, um, but I think it has to go through our facilities. Uh, a su assistant superintendent should be the one to present to the school committee on, on what he feels uh, are the necessary steps to protect our schools. And it's not just Durfee, it's all our schools. Um, just because Durfee is the newest, uh, it doesn't make it the most important. So we need to uh, focus on all schools in our district and make sure we have plans to keep them working, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Pereira. Thank you for the question, Alan. I'd like to think we, that Fall River has learned their lesson and I agree with the majority of people at the table. We need a comprehensive maintenance plan um, through facilities, people who are the best in the field, and we need to make sure we keep, we keep that up because we have a beautiful school. I also think that the pride in the building and the school community is gonna be helpful in maintaining um, the building itself. Um, and so, yeah, I agree with that. And I also agree that it's not just Durfee we're talking about, we need to make sure we're doing this across, across the board because our children need safe places to learn and our educators need safe places to educate. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. So as a therapist, I can't work with a client unless I have a concrete treatment plan that outlines goals and objectives. So I think that's really the same thing that we have to look at for Durfee. So we have a concrete 
um, facilities plan that will have our measurable goals and our objectives and different checkpoints that we can assess where we are. Um, but I wholeheartedly agree that it's not just Durfee, right? My daughter goes to Tansy. And so, you know, that's one of the last older buildings that we have in the city. And so we need to look at all of them to really create a sustainability plan for them. And then also reinstill a sense of pride and responsibility in our buildings. But again, I think that comes back to the culture of our school district. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. So yes, uh, we do expect that it's gonna look the same over the years, we have to hold people accountable to it. We need to have a, a preventative maintenance plan, but it also has to have a budget attached to it. Uh, so this being the last question, I thought we were gonna have some time to talk about the budget, but when we look at a plan, we need to fix buildings, we need to have money. So we need to look at the budget. Last night I watched a city council meeting and there was a question related to, should the city councilors weigh in on school issues? And should the school committee weigh in on city issues? The answer to that question, in my opinion, is absolutely yes, when needed. The city council has had to intervene and deal with some things that were inappropriately going on on the school committee, and I commend them for that. Same thing here. My concern, listening to what's going on, is that I'm concerned that the city of Fall River is not going to have the money to actually pay 100% of net school spending. This is a budget issue as well, so we can't talk about maintenance, fixing buildings, and hiring staff if the city doesn't have the money. So yes, we should dive into those issues because those are important to the budget for the school committee going forward. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Um, I agree with pretty much everyone on the panel. I think uh, I'm a firm believer of letting professionals do their job. Um, I know I'm no professional when it comes to that. Um, so I think hiring a committee um, to make sure that the upkeep is there. Um, like Mr. Aguiar was saying, if it's in the budget, if not, figure out alternative ways to get it done. Um, but we just can't let our schools fall apart. And I don't think, you know, Durfee's the only school. I think we have to really take a look at all the schools that we have across the board because Durfee is not the only students we have in the city. Thank you. Now it's time for our closing statements. There'll be 90 seconds as well. And we will start with the closing statements tonight with Melissa Costa Doyle. I was raised in the Maplewood area and I'm a graduate of St. Jean's, Durfee High School and Emerson College. My dad's career with DPW was my example for honest, tireless work ethic and accountability to the people you serve. My mom now retired, became a spe special education para when I was five, so the successes and challenges ha have been part of conversations my whole life. We've often provided for her students who otherwise went without as much as we could. I credit the diversity and opportunities at Durfee with my ability to pursue my dreams in bigger cities. I'm a teaching artist and a director and choreographer of children's theater. I'm also trained in using the arts to deepen understanding in other subject areas. I spent many years doing this work with our students and the potential is enormous. Students deserve to be equally supported and celebrated in all their passions, which is not happening now. Information needs to be more accessible to families in the community. If elected, I will post summaries of what happens at every school committee meeting. Paris teachers and all the staff deserve to be treated fairly and with dignity. A committee that enables nepotism and abuse from superiors fails them, loses them, and our children feel the impact. Lack of transportation is the biggest impediment to student involvement in extracurricular activities. We have safe, warm schools that are mostly empty after three, despite pleas of students at every grade level for more arts, clubs, and activities. School is where we see 10,000 kids regardless of income and family structure. I know that the resources are out there. Durfee thrives when that groundwork is laid out at the elementary and middle school levels. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dias. Thank you. I, again, I just want to thank FRC Media, Keith, um, WSAR, Farber, Reporter, for hosting tonight's event. And thank you for the Cultural Center for hosting us tonight. Again, we need to change the culture in our school department. We cannot allow what this superintendent did to repeat itself. We need a school committee members who will focus on school issues, not special interests. We owe it to the taxpayers to maintain our schools. We owe it to the great teachers, paraprofessionals, maintenance workers, kitchen staff, and all of the personnel to up their salary before we make another administrative position. We deserve school committee members who have the courage, and I'll repeat that again, the courage to make the right votes for the district and the city and put the special interests aside. Fall River, I need your vote. Let's make an example on November 2nd that we will not allow any more of these games to be played. Again, let's change the culture in our school department and I respectfully ask for one of your six votes 
the fall over school committee. And I wanted to end with this and um, agree with Mr. Aguiar. Mr. Mayor, fund our schools to 100% net school spending. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Keith. Again, thank you to FRC Media Cultural Center, uh, the panel for the Fall River Reporter, FRG TV, and WSAR. I'm a candidate for re-election to the Fall River School Committee. I was born and raised in Fall River with my parents, Joan Canole Hart, and my father, John, uh, John Jack Hart, along with my five siblings. I have two wonderful boys, Paul Jr. and Matthew. I was educated in Fall River, attending Tansy, Morton, and Durfee High School. I received my bachelor's degree from UMass Dartmouth and my master's in education from American International College. I served on the Fall River City Council for six years and I'm currently in my third term as a school committeeman. This has provided me with valuable experience which I will continue to use effectively as your school committeeman. If re-elected, I will focus on the following important issues. First, universal pre-K. We need to increase our pre-K program and make it universally available to all our pre-K children in Fall River. Two, school safety. We need to continue keeping our schools safe by providing our students and staff with the safest environment possible in all of our classrooms. Number three, chronic absenteeism. The absenteeism rate is too high in our district. Our students need to be in the classroom in order to learn. I will continue working with our leadership team to improve our chronic absenteeism rate. Four, bullying and harassment. I will continue being an advocate for anyone in our district who is being harassed and bullied. I acted on an incident this past year. It is unacceptable behavior and I will, not, I will not let it be tolerated. In conclusion, I would like to congratulate thank my you. new- Thank you, thank you. Oh, that's it, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Koleski. How are you doing today? Uh, John Koleski, I think I'm the only unfamiliar face on the, uh, on the stage. Mm. I've been gone for the past 22 years. Uh, went to serve in the United States Army. I won't lie, I didn't have the intention of coming back when I got on the plane. I had a poor taste in my mouth. I, I felt I was a burden here. I was raised by our other relatives, I learned my lessons from the parents of friends and associates. Uh, I just couldn't seem to find my place here. Uh, fast forward, I have two autistic children. That gave me the most important thing in the world, an understanding of why family is important. Family is the only thing that I have here that I couldn't replicate anywhere else. So I came back to replicate the successes I have seen in their special ed education departments in the four different states and the 13 different schools my children have attended. They do it for a fraction of the cost that we do here. They do it with an insane increase in favorable outcomes. And they do it by understanding the medical side needs to be addressed by medical professionals and the answer is not always hiring more staff, spending more money. We need to make innovation in Fall River something besides a road's name leading to the old airport and landfill. On November 2nd, if you agree with that, I'm the number four name on the list. Thank you. Ms. Larrabee. Thank you. Again, thank you, FRC Media panelists. I pre appreciate your time. I was born, raised, and educated in Fall River. I've been working at the Boys and Girls Club for 35 years. What started out as a fun way to make some money turned into a passion for both positive youth development and helping our youth to reach their full potential as productive citizens. Year after year, I've advocated for the academic careers of our youth, whether it be reaching out to coaches, guidance counselors, teachers, and even administrators. When running for my first term on school committee at Youth Candidate Night, I made a promise to them to bring the community to the youth when in need. School community partnerships are so important. Two months into my first term, COVID hit. On top of all my school committee responsibilities, I remained focused and remembered the promise I made to the youth. I formed a committee with community members, teachers, and recent Durfee graduates. We raised $36,000 selling I Support Durfee Class of 2020 lawn signs. All seniors received a gift bag, and I did the same thing for Class of 2021. The best thing about this school community partnership, I was able to keep my promise to the youth. Now seeking re-election, I want to make a promise to our Fall River residents. I promise to continue the lifelong path of advocating for children. I'm a size seven boots on the ground kind of school committee person. Thank you. Thank you. Who will Thank always you. put your kids first? Ms. Pereira. 
I want to start by thanking FRC Media and the Cultural Center for hosting this event and providing us with this opportunity, as well as Mike, Pamela, and Alan for their thoughtful questions. And also thank you to all the people behind the scenes um, who without you, we wouldn't look as good on camera, I'm sure. A little bit about myself. I'm born and raised in Fall River. I am a single mother of two daughters. I received a bachelor's degree from UMass Amherst as well as a minor. I worked as a nurse for 13 years and an educator for seven years. And currently, I'm employed at the DTA as a caseworker. And the commonality there is that I've always, throughout my career, have always worked in urban communities helping families and children because that's where my passion is. And I hope that after listening to me this evening that you understand my commitment to the community and the children of Fall River. I promise if elected, I will be dedicated and hardworking. Um, if you would like to learn a little bit more about me and the issues that are close to my heart, I ask you to check out electshellyperera.com. My contact information is on there, and I'd love to hear your thoughts and concerns, as well as humbly ask for your vote on November Thank 2nd. Thank you. Ms. Rogers. So again, I just want to reiterate our appreciation for providing us the space to speak directly to our students, our families, our community members. So now more than ever, I am committed and really eager to provide a voice for positivity and progress in our city. So it's impossible to predict what the issues, the opportunities and decisions that will come before the committee. So it's really critical that voters select committee members with the skill sets, the values that align with their vision for our district. So I have a long history of supporting kids and families. My experiences in mental health, um, that's really been my area of expertise for the last 21 years. Um, I founded a nonprofit organization that focuses on creating an inclusive learning space for our kids and families. And my organization has provided consultation, training, and support to school districts in programs across the state. Um, in addition to that, I've also partnered with our, our community partners to provide additional support to families. I'm also an educator. I've taught at Boston University along with 13 other colleges across the country. Um, but most importantly, I'm a mom to three amazing kids. So no matter what happens on November 2nd, um, I would appreciate your vote, but please know that my, my goal is still to advocate for our kids, for our community, because this is our home. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar. I'd like to congratulate and say thank you to all the candidates on the stage here today for having the courage to put your names on the ballot. Regardless of who wins the election, it is very important to be part of the process, so thank you. Uh, there's a few things I want to talk about relative to my priorities we didn't get a chance to talk about today. I'm glad to hear finally that a lot of people are talking about the pre-K initiative, the universal pre-K. I think that's quite frankly a no-brainer and it's long overdue in this committee. I w would be remiss if I didn't recognize Councilor Cliff Ponty, who is also a candidate for mayor, who has made this a major platform in his education, uh, his education platform. I hope that everyone on this stage takes a look at it and we all get unified behind that goal. Some of my priorities are we need bold initiatives such as that, full transparency. We need fiscal accountability. We have to create policies that hold people accountable for fiscal accountability. We need to increase the mental health services and special education services. We have increased it, but we need to do more. The needs are greater, and we need to do more. No excuses. We need to increase academic achievement. Like I said before, we're spending millions of dollars, but what are we getting for it? We need the achievement level to rise. The excuses have to end. We need to increase our attendance rate. Same theory. We need to raise the expectations of what we expect out of our staff. We have to have multi-year planning, preventative maintenance plans. And we also need to diversify our staff to represent our students. Once again, I am a candidate for a uh, school committee once again on election day. I respectfully ask for one of your six votes. Thank you all and God bless. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank God for being here. Um, this is a, you know, unbelievable achievement. I want to thank all of the candidates, thank the panel, FRC Media. Um, for me, I, I grew up in Fall River, uh, Forney Street, um, went to school here. Uh, you know, graduated from Durfee, uh, was counted out, you know. Uh, ended up at Rhode Island College, went there, 
went to LaSalle College, ended up getting my master's degree. Uh, just a kid from the city. I, you know, grew up here, struggled here, succeeded here. Um, you know, for me to be up here uh, is amazing. Uh, you know, I came back from California about a year ago. My passion was strictly to come back to the city and work hard, work with these kids and figure it out. When I put my name in a hat, it was strictly off a of passion and wanting to serve this community, serve the kids, and that's what I've been doing ever since I get back, got, got back. Um, you know, tireless efforts, um, sleepless nights, trying to figure out the best solution and how to serve these kids, working with the community, working with people, working with teachers, working with everyone and trying to get together and build this, build this community up. Um, my goal is to continue to do that, build relationships, and uh, get to the point where we're all good. Um, you know, so humbly ask for your, for your vote on November 2nd. Um, and if I get that vote, I promise you I'll continue to work hard. Thank you. And Mr. Chase. Um, I hear so much about uh, budgets and more money coming in, need for study committees, things such as this. I, all I see is money going out. The people of this city are hurting for money. Just because they rent, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, they, uh, they aren't paying the taxes. The, the people that uh, rent to them, the, the gas that they use in their cars, the gas that's going to be double this year, um, things such as this are really hurting a lot of people. And, you know, people in the school system, people in the city government, are more or less guaranteed a job. They're guaranteed a, a fair salary. We need to hold the line on construction. Bond issues, they say, is not tax, taxes. Bonding is taxes. Um, let's uh, try to consider how we can stop spending so much money in the city and let the people have some of that money get back to them by not paying so much in taxes. Um, I'm dis disappointed in, you know, hearing about so many things that are going to cost money here. We need to cut costs rather than spending all that money. Thank, thank you. Thank, buddy. Thank you. I want to thank all the candidates and our panelists tonight for joining us. I also want to thank our FRC media staff here tonight, working behind the scenes: Stephen Rice, Lucy Cabral, Michelle Dumas, and Alex Mello from FRG TV for helping out as well. Also, again, we'd like to thank the people here at the Cultural Center. This is a fabulous facility, and we want to thank them again for allowing us to use this facility over the past two nights for our City Council and School Committee forums. You can watch a replay of this forum and find out more about all the candidates running in Fall River by tuning into FRC Media Channel 95, as well as visiting our website at frmedia.org. Join us on Wednesday, October 20th, as we'll be collaborating with WSAR and FRG TV on a mayoral debate featuring Mayor Paul Guggen and City Council President Cliff Ponte. You can watch that debate on Channel 18, Channel 95, and on Facebook, and also listen to the debate on WSAR. Please vote on November 2nd. We'll be partnering once again with FRG TV to provide live election results. Thanks for watching, and have a good night.